This frame is just nasty. Hi, I'm Rajiv, and today I'd like to talk to you about old picture frames. So this right here is a watercolor study that I did. It's a copy of an old painting, and I did this as a homework exercise for my watercolor class, and it was one of those rare moments where I thought, wow, I really like this, and I want to put that in a frame. When that happens, I actually go to my repository of frames, and I do have a collection of empty frames, and I find one that fits. So in order to do that, I'm always on the lookout for frames, and when something is cheap, when something is, is really inexpensive, I buy it, I bring it home, I add it to the stash. When I have time, I fix it up, and then there's frames hanging around that one day will have a piece of artwork in it, like this one. Look at this beautiful thing. So this is the type of frame that I find more often in my searching. This is a frame that is solid wood, but all of this decoration, this is not carved out of wood. This is called compo. If this frame had all of this decoration hand carved out of wood, which you can find often in museums, there are beautiful old paintings with frames that have been hand carved out of wood, that would be an insanely expensive. Or if you found one antiquing and it was cheap, you'd be really lucky. That would be a treasure find. But this type of frame and this type of frame, this is commonly what you'll find. A solid wood frame, 19th century, early 20th century, and then all of this decoration was made out of a material that it's sort of like glue, like rabbit skin glue mixed with chalk that forms a kind of paste and it would be pressed into a mold, pulled out of the mold, and then applied to the wood. What that does mean, though, is that the frames are very delicate. And you can see here, on this frame, that there are quite a few areas that have just broken off. And they, when they break off and fall off, you can see the wood underneath where the compo was affixed. I like to take frames like this and turn them into frames like this. And it is possible, and I'm gonna show you how I do that today. Here's a distressed gilded frame. This was a quick oil study that I did of a model who sat for me. The wonderful thing about all of these frames is they weren't a lot of money. So the techniques that I'm gonna show you today they come with a disclaimer. I am not a professional restorer. I have not been professionally trained. Most of this stuff is just stuff that I've experimented with and figured out on my own. I do suggest trying these techniques on inexpensive frames that you don't care very much about. That's kind of how you learn how to do something. So here are a couple of frames that I found recently these were all at a thrift store and I knew we were making this video so I didn't clean them up at all and they are filthy. There are three of them. Look at this. This, I don't know where this was. Might have been sitting in a barn for 50 years. But I thought these are great examples to show you exactly what I do when I bring these frames home to bring them back to life. So let's get started. If a frame is really ornate like this one, you don't actually want to take a rag and wipe down these very delicate areas, especially when the compo bits are falling off. This, this is dangerous to all this work in here. So the technique that I'm going to show you is the technique that I would use on both a simple frame like this and an ornate frame like this to clean in all these bits in here. This is something that a conservator friend of mine showed me how to do, and it's a technique that, that is used in conservation. It's using cotton swabs. 
So you can use a swab, a Q-tip is a cotton swab, and you, you can get just a pack of Q-tips and use them, but that becomes really wasteful of Q-tips. So this right here is a bamboo skewer, and you need one of these, and then you need rolled cotton. And this is thick absorbent cotton that you would find at the drugstore, and it's for dressing wounds. And you can get this in various lengths and various sizes, but basically you want the cotton that's, it's just a wad of cotton that you can pull apart. And what you do is you wet the end of the skewer, you take a little bit of the cotton and you hold it in between your first two fingers and using your thumb you anchor it down and you twist and you create a beautiful cotton swab. You are going to end up using lots of little cotton bits to clean the frame because you go little by little. So this is just water. And to the, in its simplest form of cleaning a frame like this, used just distilled water, make sure that the swab is not soaking wet. So even if you need to tamp out a little bit of the excess water, do that. It's better to use less water than more water. You don't want this dripping all over the place. And then very gently you rub while turning the swab. This is a very gentle way of removing dirt, especially from fragile areas. So under here, this is, this is just stained wood or varnished wood, but right here is gilding. This is actual gold leaf gilding. And I, I saw it when I saw these frames and I don't want to damage this. Gilding, if it's done the old way, where the gold is just sitting on the surface, and it's not glued down permanently, it's very susceptible to being removed easily. So if I went at this with a rag, I could pull that gold right off and destroy the beautiful gilded um, rebate in here. So I don't wanna do that, and that's why I'm using these swabs. Now, look at this, this is very satisfying. Look how dirty that is. This frame is just nasty. <laughs> so <laughs> what you do is, once the swab is soiled, you pull it off, you put it in your waste bin, and you get another little bit of cotton, and you roll another swab. So once the swab is soiled, you don't keep using it, because then you're just spreading around dirt. And yes, this is slow work but it's this is this is the way i do it because this is how you maintain the integrity of what is under the dirt and not damage it and there comes kind of a magic moment when the thing underneath starts to look at you and smile and it's like 200 years of something saying thank you so much for letting me see the light again i was suffocating under here Look at this, that's what it's saying, and I can see in the light that it's shining. There's still a little more cleaning to do to get it right brand spanking new again, but do you see that? If all of the dirt is removed, this swab will not have any color on it. Okay, there we go. So now I've removed almost all the dirt from Still a little bit, but have a look at that gilding. And here you can see this little white bit, that's called gesso, and that's the layer under the gold. That is the layer that the gold is adhering to, and it means that the gold has disappeared from this edge. So either I rubbed too much, or through abrasion, the gold wore off. But if you start seeing more of this white, it means you're removing gold. And this is why you want to be gentle and gradual with this process. Now I'm just going to show you, I'm going to do a little bit of the wood. 
And let's see what that looks like because I don't even know what the wood looks like under here. The great thing about making your own little cotton swabs is that you can make them different sizes. The reading in this carving here is very narrow, so I can make a cotton swab with a very tiny tip that will fit right into this space. And if I'm doing a much bigger space, I can make the head of the cotton a lot bigger. Wow. Okay, so I can see that this is a kind of reddish wood. It looks like it might be mahogany or cherry. Another thing that I learned when I was shown this process by a real conservator is you never take this and dip it back in the water. You have to treat this water like holy water. Only a clean swab goes in here. You don't double dip and put the dirty swab back in there. You know what I mean? Jelly bean. Okay, there we go. So this is, this is pretty clean. And I just want to show you the difference. Pretty amazing. I think the thing that I would do at the very end of this, when this is all clean, I would go over the wood with some finishing wax. Just a very light coat of wax with a cotton, a bit of cotton, or even a very soft lint-free cloth. Uh, and just apply a layer of wax to the wood, buff it up, and then this is good to put something into and hang on the wall. And look at this. You can see here that when these three are done, I think they'll make a nice grouping together on the wall. Let me talk to you a little bit about gilding. My experience in gilding has taught me about how to approach fixing a frame like this. The frame is wood. The frame gets coated with usually rabbit skin glue if it's 19th century. And then the compo is put on. All of this decoration is put on. And then once the compo is put on, a layer of gesso, white gesso, which is rabbit skin glue mixed with chalk, that gets put on. So then the whole frame is white. And after the gesso goes on, they put on a layer of clay, clay mixed with rabbit skin glue, which is called bowl, B-O-L-E. And the bowl is either yellow or red, two colors of clay. Yellow is a, gives a brighter look when the thing is gilded and covered in gold. Red gives a deeper, richer look to the gold when, when everything is done. So sometimes you'll see on a gilded frame, oh, they're like, they're bread bits all over. And that's the bowl coming through where the gold has worn off. Sometimes that's actually intentional. Frames are created to look a little worn out and older. They rub the gold off in places to show the, the red bowl underneath. So when I'm working from this stage back, at, at the beginning, I look at the frame to, to try to figure out what I'm looking at. Is this the original gilding? And when I'm looking at this, this, this area looks like actual gold leaf. But this in here, this looks like paint. And you will often find that old gilded frames have gold paint on them. What, what happened in the past is a frame might have been cleaned too much or maybe it was damaged and instead of having it properly restored or repaired by someone who knew how to gild the frame or re-gild the frame the very quick fix was just to get some gold paint that matched the gold as close as possible and then they just painted on the areas where the gold had disappeared so this is something you'll often see and the sad thing for me is when a, a frame that originally had gold leaf has just been completely painted over. They just painted the whole thing with what we call radiator paint. It's this hideous, cheap, gold, oil-based paint that would be suitable to paint a radiator with because radiators were often painted with this gold paint. So you will find radiator painted frames that were originally gilded. and. I have gone through the process of removing radiator paint from areas of a frame. When I see, oh, that, like, I don't like how that looks, I've taken it off. Mm -hmm. 
So what I would do to start out with this frame is to clean it and to just get rid of the areas where there's dust and dirt. Trusty old bamboo skewer, distilled water, small, small cotton swabs that are going to fit into this delicate area. And I would go in like this and I would clean all of this. This, was, this would be the first step. And even though this is gold and it looks gold, oh Heidi, look how dirty it is. And I would avoid these areas. I wouldn't clean in here because this is what's going to be repaired and this is very delicate right now. So cleaning, first step. Once the whole frame was cleaned, the next step is the complicated but very interesting bit. The delicate bits have broken off. What do you do? Well, this is a repeating pattern. All of this is a repeating pattern. The way that we reconstruct the missing bits is by first making a mold of the existing bits. You can use many different things to make a flexible mold on a frame like this. You can use silicone, you can use dental alginate, what dentists use to make molds of teeth. And all of this stuff can be found in an art store. So if you go to an art store, ask for the mold making section and just browse and find the product that makes a flexible mold. So this specific stuff that I'm using, it's a two part compound and it's mixed together at a ratio of 20 to one. So I am going to measure out 60 grams. There we go, a little less, 61, good enough. Three grams of part B. So what I do is warm this up a little bit first, and you do wanna work fairly quickly. You have some working time, but and just work as fast as possible. Warm this up. And then add part B into the middle of part A. Fold it up and really incorporate the two together. Okay, that's pretty good. And now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna actually make a mold of this entire section right here, but I wanna make sure that I get a nice clean area, like up here. And I wanna make sure that I get a complete repeat. So I lay this on here and I press very solidly into the frame so that no air bubbles are formed and that I get a really good clean mold. And I'm going over the edge here I can already feel that it's starting to harden. So you you don't you don't have a lot of time. There is a bit of urgency with doing this, but this goes on here and then it sits here for half an hour. I actually prepped this earlier and I have two little bits that I made earlier. I made a bit along the edge over here and I made a bit for the inside over here. The next step is using the mold that we've made to create the positive pieces. So this is now the negative, and we're going to create the positive pieces that are going to fill in the missing gaps. So I have my frame set up here for the repair work. And now I'm going to, let's start with this bit right here. So this is, this is what is kind of like a puzzle, nice little puzzle, is you find the area that you need to replace, okay? And I see that it's right here in between these little berries and these little berries. Now I'm gonna take my mold 
which is a nice repeat. There are many repeats in this little length. And I, I hold the mold next to where the missing area is and I find exactly the point where it matches. So I have lined this up exactly so that that's there and it's there. This is missing and it's in here and this is right here. And now what I do is I get some water-based air drying clay. And I like to use this stuff. It comes from Italy. And, but there are lots of air drying clays that you can use. You don't use pottery clay. Don't use something that needs to be fired in a kiln. It needs to be clay that you can actually just put on and allow to dry. And it needs to be water soluble because the glue that I'm using is water based. I soften it, I stick it in my mold. Watch this, okay? Make a little sausage. So I'm gonna take this sausage and put it in the mold and press it firmly into the negative space in there. And now, very carefully lift it out. And the reason why I did the whole thing is so that the area that I need in the middle isn't marred by my fingers pulling, pulling it out of the mold. But look at that. That is the positive that we need. And this, this is always the part where it makes me just smile, is seeing like, oh, look, look what we made. Okay, now I'm gonna get my frame and I'm going to apply some glue. And I'm using a wood glue here, which is what I like to use. I'm applying glue to the area that we're going to affix this to. I need a little knife. And I didn't clean my tools after the last pottery session. Dirty fellow. Okay. So this is the tricky bit. It's a little bit of surgery. You have to align it exactly and then cut it. Cut it to where it's needed. There. And then trim away the edges. Let's do this on the cloth so we don't cut our fingers. And sometimes what you'll need to do is adjust the depth of the piece because maybe the clay wasn't flush with the edge of the mold. So this, this part, warning, it's finicky. And there is a bit of art involved in adjusting the positive so that it fits beautifully and that it's seamless. And now I'm going to place it right in there and you'll see that the glue displaces. And when the glue displaces, I just, using my fingers with a light touch, I press the glue into the clay and I press the clay into the glue. And the two kind of because the clay is water soluble, the two meld together in a very nice way. There. At this point, what I'm going to do is actually take some tools and re-sculpt the transition between the old area, the, ex the area that exists, and the new area. It's forgiving in that when it's so tiny like this and the details are really small, you can just suggest the lines. You don't have to make them exact. And when everything is painted gold, because we are going to paint this, we're not going to re-gild this, you won't even notice. Now I'm going to leave that alone. But now, this little space that was missing, it's the relief, it's been restored. The 
some, something about this feels like uh, cheating, <laughs> like trickery. Like ah, can I can I trick them into thinking that it's that it's the original? But there's something also very satisfying about this because you're you're taking this thing that maybe everyone else thought was garbage, or that was going to get eventually tossed in the trash, and you're you're making it really usable and beautiful again. So I'm not going to complete this whole frame with you here because you all have other things to do. But I want to show you, look at this, come back to life. So this has to dry. And once this is dry, you move to the next step, which I will now demonstrate. Really, you're supposed to wait till this fully dries before you paint it. But in the interest of time, I'm going to paint it while it's wet. Don't do this at home. Just wait till it dries. If this is all gold leaf, you're replacing the areas with a water composite clay. You can't gild this the way that you would gild true gesso. So what I do is I paint these little repaired bits, but my tip is to not just buy one tube of gold paint. Often you can find different shades of gold. So this company makes like six different shades of gold. Here I have gold leaf, that's the name of the color, autumn gold, and Grecian gold. And I'm actually going to put all three golds on my palette here. Thin down the paint and test a little bit. So I'm going to test one color on its own. Oh, it can be a bit darker. I don't want to go over areas beyond what I've repaired. Keep it to a minimum. And I can see that the recesses of this original are very dark. So I'd go in later with some wax probably, just some dark wax, and antique the bits that I've painted just to make them match. This, this, this is the part where you could just really pay attention to the smallest details and be a little detective and make make your repairs just seamlessly blend in with what was there before. Okay, it's happening. Look at that, there was no corner here before and now there's a corner. So this is how you take a frame that started out looking like this and turn it into something that with many hours of cleaning and careful work turns into something that looks like this where from far away you would never know that there were bits missing that's all there is for today thank you so much for joining me please subscribe to my channel those numbers go up and that helps us keep making videos. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.